This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Joining us today is Sean Heathcote, the CEO of Neo Energy Metals. Thank you very much for joining us again, Sean. Of course, the last time we spoke was at your IPO in London on the Stock Exchange. But it's good to be chatting to you today. How are you doing? We're doing fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And thanks for having us on. No, it's great to be talking. It's very poignant as well. We'll come on to some of the recent news from the company and the activities. But the reason I wanted to have a chat with you is because there's, of course, been an announcement from the uh, or an article from the Department of Energy, the United States Department of Energy, following the COP28 summit, which is going on at the moment. And it's very significant, really. I'll just read some of it because it's, uh, it really speaks volumes for the uranium industry. During the World Climate Action Summit of the 28th Conference, the parties of the UN Framework Convention on the Climate Change Today more than 20 countries from four continents launched a declaration to triple nuclear energy. The declaration recognises the key role for nuclear energy in achieving global net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and keeping the 1.5 degree goal within reach. And a couple of things that are really significant from there, recognising that, the, that nuclear energy is already the second largest source of clean, dispatchable baseload power with benefits for energy security, recognising the global installed nuclear capacity must triple by 2050 in order to reach global net zero emissions by the same year, and a commitment to work together to advance a global, aspir to advance a global aspirational goal of tripling nuclear energy capacity from 2020 by 2050, and to mobilise investments in nuclear power, including through innovative financing mechanisms. So finally, maybe there's some recognition here, you know, because we've been talking about this for a while about the anti-nuclear sort of power movement that's been going on, driven by certain activists in the in the area. But maybe this is a turning point. What do you think? Absolutely, a turning point. I mean, and it, it was it was fundamental to where the nuclear needs to go in terms of what it's going to do for baseload supply for the world, and the fact that there's 20 countries. Uh, signed up with the there was other commitment to get other countries signed up as well so i mean that's also part of the announcement that they made mm -hmm. so um, from our perspective uh, and from all uranium explorers and producers perspective it's just great news and whether or not they actually achieve the tripling is is, is somewhat irrelevant it's just the fact that they everybody's committing to make nuclear the new base load and what that's going to do for the uranium uh, mining sector it's yeah. fundamental it's fundamental, isn't it? And they're big countries. You know, you've got the United States there, Finland, France, Hungary, Moldova, the Netherlands, where I am, the United Kingdom, the UE, the United Arab Emirates, Slovenia, Slovakia, Poland. I notice Germany is not uh, on the list. <laughs> but uh... Germany's uh, sort of nuclear power contribution is very, very small compared to the rest of their power contribution. It's about 4% of their base load. Uh, and they've only got a couple of reactors which are busy closing down or um, so yeah. they're not significant in the nuclear market, and it's a question of whether they turn the corner and whether they, they want to move forward in nuclear like the rest of Europe is doing. Yeah, but it's very good, very good to see that announcement or that article just the last uh, day or two on there. I mean, we've talked about it for a while, how clean uh, and green source of the uh, energy that nuclear is. Very small footprint, as long as it's all managed. We have the technology to do it and manage it safely. It's really the, the answer to clean green power as we move towards net zero. And I do obviously like the fact about encouraging, uh, mobilising investments. Of course, this is uh, an opportunity we're talking about here today with Neo Energy Metals. And there are not many investment opportunities for uranium. I was at the Resourcing Tomorrow conference last week and the theme was definitely uranium. Of course, the price performing very well. A lot of the deposits are over in Saskatchewan. That's a very prolific, uh, the Athabasca Basin for uranium deposits. But you're, of course, over in uh, South Africa, aren't you? You're sort of um, in the, the, the Northern Cape near Springbok. I wonder if you can just tell us, before we get into some of the latest news here, or the latest goings on, just a little bit about the, the, the project, the deposit, its location, and, and, and um, you know, what, what, why you like it. Yeah. Um, 
obviously it's a sufficient uh, deposit. It's anywhere from sort of surface down to uh, the bulk of it at 15 meters. So it's mm. very, very close to surface. It's in a sand based environment. So it's very, very easy to mine. There's about 4.7 million pounds in a jork resource that we've currently got mm -hmm. uh, out into the market. And that was the basis of the IPO. Uh, obviously, we want to increase that significantly over the course of the next uh, few months. But in essence, it's very easy to, to mine. It's very easy to process. Uh, and we see that it being very cost effective to process other than uh, the, the deeper deposits that you would see in the likes of the Athabasca Basin. So for, from our perspective, it's easy to get at, and um, we hope to be in production very, very quickly to take advantage of, obviously, the significant turns in the uranium market. Well, of course, that's always good to hear, getting in production fairly quickly. How realistic is that? I know you, you've mentioned there that your resource of £4.7 million, and you're targeting over 10 million aren't you with the upcoming well the, the the program that you hope to start in q1 yes uh obviously we've mobilized the site we've appointed a new regional manager very experienced uh, very very good ties to the local community um obviously grew up there so he's going to be driving that uh, closely for us on the ground we're already at site um to pull out what are surface samples from the last drilling program that never got analyzed which we are hoping to add somewhere in the region of 1.1 to 2 million pounds to the existing 4.7 uh, and include them in the mineral resource estimate. And then obviously the inquiries are out for the new drilling program, which is we're going to do a minimum of six and a half thousand meters, okay. which equates to 350 holes. I mean, it's significantly more than you would get in the Athabasca Basin. So to try and find that additional 3 million pounds and, and historically, when you look at the drilling, any infill drilling that you've done in that region and on that deposit has increased the size of the resource. So we're mm -hmm. uh, very confident that we can actually get to that £10 million over the course of the next few months. Okay. Uh, have some positive news to put out to the market. And is your drill programme, is it planned or is this part of the tender process that the guys have to sort of come back to you with a, a proposed plan? In essence, what we've got is um, from the Jork uh, resource and the mineral resource assessment put together, there was an analysis of what needed to be done to increase the size of the resource from the competent person. That competent person is still on board with us in, in that regard. And we're basically going to focus on his plan, okay. find that additional resource that's out there. Uh, in essence, what we're going to the marketplace for is a costing. Yeah? And it's an updated costing from the budgetary estimates that we've currently got to get on the ground and start delivering the work in the new year. Indeed. Well, you did say you want to get on the ground and start working and the hard work begins. You've got the funds to do this, presumably, so no concerns there. You want to take this to a measured resource, don't you, as well? That's another key point from this, the, the recent news announced. Yeah. In essence, obviously, we need to take it to measured resource in terms of uh, getting compliance with the application for the mining right and, sure. and moving the project forward. So it's just going to be the first three years of operation that we'll take to measure the bulk of the remainder of the drilling will be in line with in increasing the resource size. Okay. So around about 20 to 30% of the, the drilling will be required to get to measured in terms of infill, the balanced okay. resource ex expansion. Okay. And are you targeting a specific grade? Do you have any idea of the grades at the moment? Uh, the average grade we're looking at at the minute is about 400 ppm, just under 400 ppm. And what we found, if you look at the historical drilling, any infill drilling um, actually increased the, the average grade because you would hit the Lacustrian ponds and you would hit those environments uh, which the uranium had reduced out of. Uh, and some of them were significantly higher, obviously 5,000 ppm uh, on a oh. number of drill holes. So, and that was on an infill drilling basis. Okay. So typically that's what we see as an increase in resource and average grade. And in terms of that, that sort of 400 ppm, then what's that like in terms of a, a, you know, a, a, an economical grade? Do you talk in ppm or do you think, can you talk in percentages as well? Well, the ppm is far easier for us to talk around there. I mean, it's I mean, um, 5,000 ppm, 0.5%, uh, I think it is. In terms okay. Of, um, so in essence, from our perspective, we can talk in uh, ppm far easier okay. than to, to delineate the resource in that regard. And also because of the nature of the resource and the nature of who we're comparing ourselves against, everybody 
talks along the same lines. Sure, okay. But at the Henkries project, then you you're really going. It's it's the volume, isn't it? That's there over the grade in in this in the set. Is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, it's it's yeah. really because it's official. That's it's 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 close to surface, and yeah. a lot of people may not look at 400 ppm and they'll say, "Well, okay, 400 ppm is not economical." No, at depth, it's not economical. But literally, when you're dragging it from surface and the bulk of it eight meters below surface, and you're looking at a couple of benches, it's very very economical. Okay. Now you're hoping to have the drill contact, sorry, the drill contractors appointed by Q1 and have the program finished by Q3. So fairly swift, sort of well, you know, rapid program there, really. And at the end of that, you want to get out as a new resource. Is that correct in the measured category? Yes, there'll be a portion of the resource will be in measured. Um, okay. The bulk of it will still be in indicated, and some will be in inferred. But obviously, we only need three years worth of operation to be measured. We don't, and there's no real point. Okay get more of it out as measured because once you start the operations you're going to be drilling anyway sure. to find where the next uh, the next year's production is going to come from so i mean how quickly do you think you will know that uh, you can actually get into production then i mean what comes after the drilling do you have to go down the dfs route in essence what we're looking to do is update the feasibility study that uh, angler put out in the data from 1977 to 79 we've got okay. huge amounts of data i mean masses and masses of geotechnical plant layout um pilot plant 211 test pits six months of pilot plant operation so we pretty much know exactly how this ore is going to behave in the processing route and all we're doing is updating that cost estimate and we'll we'll spend the first three months updating the cost estimate uh, and then we'll look at try and get a mining right application in uh, as early as possible because those okay. take 12 months um, at minimum in terms of the regulatory process. Uh, and thereafter, we can make a decision on a, a availability of applicable funds and what we can actually get committed, whether we need to go the feasibility study route or we go straight into a front-end engineering design. Right. Okay. So this is could be happening really in, what, 2025 then, potentially actually getting some uh, op production operations going? Well, it'll be the start of um start of it yeah what we hope at that time if the stars align and if we get the right support in terms of where the capital sits then that's where the stars will take us for starting the construction program 2025 um could take longer if we need to go the feasibility study and given as well of course that performance at the moment in the uranium price you're talking there about wanting to get into production as soon as you can to take advantage of this what are you picking up from uh, you know your ear to the ground on the uranium price performance where it might stabilize where it might go and what it means for uh, investment opportunities and in other companies operating in, in in the uranium mining sector yes yeah i mean obviously the price is up about 40 percent over the past 12 months we're sort of sitting around the 80 dollars a pound mark and that does demarginalize a lot of the mothball production that gets them back into production in terms of, say, Boss Energy's got two million pounds coming into the market. Paladin's got another four million pounds potentially coming into the market. But again, that's a drop in the ocean as to where the uranium um, supply has to be in order to meet these new demands that are going to come to the market from the, the increase in uh, power generation. From our perspective, we don't need the price much higher than where it currently sits in order okay. to get um, the entries into the marketplace in, in terms of producing. I think for some of the bigger producers, the deeper producers, the price has to go northwards, closer to the $100 a pound, and it has to stay there for a significant time in order to make that capital available. So from our perspective, we don't need anything stellar, but I think the market in general to, to meet that demand does need to see an increase in where the uranium price is from present. Okay. And do you think it will stabilise where it is now? Or do you think it will continue to go up? I know it's difficult to make price predictions as such, but you know, given the supply, what are you seeing on the supply demand side of things? I think that the market where it sits at the minute is pretty much controlled by the likes of Kazatomprom and Cameco. They, they, they control where the price sits in terms of what production volumes they're putting out. And they are uh, prioritizing value over volume at present, uh, which is which is great for the market. And as long as they maintain that structure and maintain that approach, then we can see long term sustained prices where they currently sit, which obviously is great for the industry in general. And I and I can't see in the short term that those prices are going to fall away. It's, okay. it's not in their best interest to see them 
uh, to drop off, uh, and certainly not in the best interest of the nuclear industry to see them drop away. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Sean Heathcote, the CEO of Neo Energy Metals. Thanks very much, Mark. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like, or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.